Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, join us to discuss Dateline Saudi reporting on the tumultuous U.S. relations. Dr. Shanzer will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the, at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Now with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Dr. Jonathan Chanzer. Thank you, Stacey. Um, and great to be with everybody again. Uh, once again, wanna just thank uh, the Middle East Forum for hosting me. And as many of you know, I, I did get my start in the policy world after graduate school at uh, the Middle East Forum in Philadelphia. So it's a place that continues to be near and dear to my heart. Um, I am recently back from a trip to Saudi Arabia. Um, much of the trip entailed my uh, slogging through PowerPoints, where I was subjected to Saudi key performance indicators or KPIs on a range of different issues. I'm not going to get into those uh, PowerPoints. I'll spare you those. I am going to give you the readout um, from what I learned from those PowerPoint decks, as well as some of the other uh, things that I learned through my travels. I've got this broken down into, I guess, uh, four or so, actually maybe six um, sort of key rubrics. I'll uh, I'll share a couple of vignettes and thoughts about each one of these, and then I'll be very happy to uh, take questions uh, as they come up. Um, let me start by talking about the status of women in the kingdom. Um, and I'll note, by the way, that this is, I believe, my fourth trip to Saudi Arabia. So I've been watching these changes now since 2017, and they've been nothing short of remarkable. And I think nowhere do I see as much change as I have um, than in uh, the role of women in society. Many of the presentations that we received at the various ministries um, and, um, and, and entities around Saudi Arabia, many of these presentations were made by women uh, and women who are not fully covered, uh, just had hair covering as was um, required by apparently uh, the, the government. Um, but no longer is it the case that women are to be seen but not heard or not seen nor heard. Um, we now see diplomats who are women uh, that are uh, running some of the affairs of the kingdom, including here in Washington, DC, Princess Rima is the ambassador. Um, the veil culture is changing uh, undeniably. You can walk around um, on the streets uh, if you can bear the heat, um, or you can walk around in malls and you can see women um, no longer uh, sort of uh, sitting on the uh, sitting off to the side, uh, having a full face covering, just with the exception of the the eyes. You now see them. Uh, I think um, really. Uh, walking around quite freely and openly and not really thinking about it any longer. As one woman told us, um, this is a matter of choice now, um, how women dress. And that is, of course, remarkable. Um, since 2018, we've seen that women are driving in the kingdom. They no longer require male chaperones. Uh, the Mutawa, the religious police that were at one point going around and patrolling the kingdom uh, for modest dress, they have uh, eff effectively been removed from Saudi Arabia. They still maintain offices, but they're no longer prominent. Um, there is, I think, it, it's not 100% uh, going in all the right direction. We understand that uh, women, for example, who are let out of prison still need a U.S. or a, a um, um, sorry, a male um, a guardian to approve of their release. This we heard from a U.S. diplomat. Um, but one of the things that I just found remarkable, and I'll just say this in conclusion, is just walking around the mall in Riyadh and having women come up to me trying to sell things more aggressively. This is a huge change. And so um, I'd say that that is a um, one of the more uh, exciting things to see over the last um, five to seven years and we'll hope that it continues to move in that direction. Really remarkable change. The other, the other thing that I thought was interesting, and this I'm, I'm addressing sort of the social issues first. Um, what I thought was remarkable is that there is a tourism industry now in Saudi Arabia. There was not one uh, when I first started going, and there's it was certainly one of those places where very few people um, would want to uh, to go for a, a tour. People would go to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, and that essentially accounted for Saudi tourism. We're now seeing real changes. Um, one area that I visited now on two different trips is a place called Boulevard, 
Uh, it's an open pedestrian mall. It's got a number of really nice restaurants. It's got live music. Um, it has this sort of feel about it as if it's Times Square, very large screens with large advertisements, lots of lights and, and light shows. And uh, at any rate, one gets a sense there that there is real freedom. Uh, you can see women sitting out and smoking uh, water pipes, shishas, uh, men and women mixing together, listening to music. Again, not a Saudi Arabia that I think many of us uh, had read about uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and certainly not one that you'd expect to see. Um, tourist visas are now a thing uh, in Saudi Arabia. They've been around since 2019. Uh, I, I had a chance to visit a couple of spots while I was there, a, an old city in Riyadh called Diria. It's a, sort of a, um, an, a city dating back hundreds of years uh, with roots to the royal family. Um, they're going through, it's a, it's a mega project, undeniably. Uh, I was at a, a spot called Edge of the World, which reminded me quite a bit of um, uh, sort of a Grand Canyon type thing where you could drive for an hour outside of Riyadh and they now have um, a place for tourists to go and hike and take wonderful pictures. And then actually the probably the more interesting place that I visited on this trip was a place called Al Ula, which looked quite a bit like Petra, Nabataean ruins from 2000 years ago. Um, and, and these are just a few of the projects. There's Neom, uh, that's another major project that's happening near the Jordanian and Israeli border. They're fixing the town of Jeddah to make it more tourist appropriate. Um, this is no longer a hermit kingdom is the bottom line. Uh, now, part of this is about keeping money inside the kingdom. They want to make sure that Saudis don't travel to Bahrain to go drinking on the weekends or to go watching movies. Uh, so the Saudis have decided to create things um, inside the kingdom that it would attract uh, additional funds and, and not see that seepage of finance. But part of this truly is about change. Um, and, and there is a dedication to this reform process right now that I am convinced is real. Now, the question is how much of it holds, uh, how much of it is long-term. These are things that are unknowable right now, but again, remarkable changes that we had not seen before. Um, now, there are those who come from the West who would say that the greatest downside for the tourism industry is that there is no alcohol. Um, but if you've read the, the newspapers just in recent days, they're, they've made an announcement that in Neom in particular, it appears that they're going to be relaxing uh, those laws. So stay tuned. But there is, in fact, a tourist uh, industry that I think is uh, remarkable to behold. Now, um, let me talk for a minute about Wahhabism. This is the radical ascetic brand of Islam that got the kingdom in so much trouble um, uh, over 9-11, uh, if not before and after. Um, we don't know if it's dormant or dead, but we do know that the footprint of Wahhabism in the kingdom right now is far less than it ever used to be. Now, you've probably seen places uh, advertised like Itzidal, which is the uh, famous place uh, for combating uh, extremism, countering extre extremism. This is the place that famously the king of Saudi Arabia, the president of um, of Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, and Donald Trump put their hands on that orb. This was in this center, and there's they do quite a bit of messaging about um, how they want to combat extremism online. Of course, yeah, Facebook and Twitter and other online outlets have the ability to do that themselves, but nevertheless, I think it is important uh, that the Saudis are engaging in this activity. There's also, of course, the Muslim World League, which used to be a major feeder of Wahhabist propaganda, uh, funds for spreading Wahhabism abroad. It's now run by a guy named Muhammad al Isa. He has famously visited Auschwitz. He recognizes the Holocaust, and he is dedicated to engaging um, it, with the Jewish community uh, abroad, with the Christian community, um, and is really dedicated to trying to convey that the Saudis um, do in fact see the Christians and Jews as Ahl al-Kitab, as they call it in Arabic, the people of the book. Um, I will say that uh, what one thing that bothers me a bit when I hear about the when I hear the rhetoric is there is no owning of the mistakes of the past. In other words, there is no reckoning for what happened during um, or after 9-11. Um, but there does appear to be a clear vision for the future. Um, one um, one uh, interlocutor that we had during this trip really shocked me, floored me when he described his country as non-ideological. 
This was not something that I would ever expect to hear from a country like Saudi Arabia 20 some years ago. Um, they talk now about stability, the importance of stability and prosperity. These were not the way, this was not the way that they approached foreign policy, to put it mildly, um, in, uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of the 1979 revolution in Iran, which is arguably what pushed the Saudis to try to um, export uh, Wahhabism abroad in, in sort of competition. Now, the irony of all of this is that uh, the key to the continued reform and the diminishing uh, sort of footprint of Wahhabism. The key to all of this is MBS, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He has cracked down on clerics. He's centralized the messaging coming out of the mosques. The question is, in my mind, uh, will the U.S. and other Western countries continue to at least nominally support this activity, or are they going to continue to try to hold him to account for sins of his past? Um, it's an interesting question, but I do believe that he is the key to the reforms that we're watching. The other thing that I think we all need to keep an eye on is whether this is something that resonates among the Saudi people. And this is, of course, unknowable. We just don't know whether the reforms that are taking place, the moderation, the diminishing, uh, the diminishing of uh, Wahhabi Islam, whether this is something that is roundly appreciated. The younger Saudis seem to appreciate it and want to buy in. The older ones are the ones that we've got questions about. And again, it's, it's not like you can do accurate polling in Saudi Arabia and walk away with a clear answer. Um, oil. This is obviously a big moment for oil. Aramco is the key to all of it. It's the, the key to the growth of all of the mega projects and everything else that's going on inside the kingdom. The attack on Abqaiq by Iran, um, the attack on Aramco, was their 9-11. And they have deep concerns about the lack of a U.S. response. That, of course, happened during Donald Trump's time in office. And I think there's even greater concern now with a Biden administration that appears even less uh, committed to defending the kingdom. And of course, the relationship has always been that the Saudis supply oil, the United States uh, provides security, and that's been the basis for the relationship. That's not what they're seeing right now. I think they're concerned uh, about the lack of response. They're concerned about the Iran-backed Houthis and Shia militia in uh, places like Iraq and Syria. Um, and so there is a... Um, uh, there's a lot of concern there. There's a lot of concern about the pivot away from oil, uh, or at least the attempt to do so uh, on the part of world powers. Um, and so for now, at any rate, I think the Saudis see opportunity to draw from those oil funds significantly. I think it still makes up 90 or 95 percent of the state budget. Um, they have 17 mega and giga projects, as they're calling it, billions and billions of dollars that will be funded almost entirely by oil. Um, the investments in tourism and further growth, eventually they understand that the, the money will not be the same, that the level of income will drop. And um, that is fueling Vision 2030. But the question is, this vision, will they able to be able to reach it? Are they doing uh, enough right now to pivot the society away from oil with the sheer amount of projects and money that's going in? Um, Ties with the United States and then ties with Israel is how I'll wrap this up. And I do realize I'm running a few minutes late, late but I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to speed it up. Ties with the U.S. Um, a mixed bag. There's frustration that the U.S. doesn't appreciate the change that it, I think is rather obvious. And then I think diplomats on the ground are noticing as well. Um, on, on the other side of this, there is the ambivalence about China, which I think has the United States uh, more concerned that the Chinese are trying to muscle into the Arabian Peninsula uh, and uh, the Saudis appear to be susceptible. The Saudis are brushing off the concerns at the same time about Khashoggi uh, and the murder of, uh, of, of this uh, Saudi-born journalist uh, in Turkey in 2018. Um, the U.S., I think, remains deeply concerned about the message that that sent. I don't think that the State Department is quite ready to let go of all of that. But as we saw with the president's visit there earlier this summer, uh, things are thawing. And I think there is an effort to put this uh, behind both countries after MBS spent several years in, in, in basically diplomatic Siberia. Um, the Yemen issue, which was once a, a major problem between the United States and Saudi Arabia, is now more under control, but frustration obviously is still lingering. Um, 
the timing of all of this tension, I'll just say, strikes me as very odd. 9-11 would have been the time to really talk about cutting off ties with the Saudis, given all the grave damage that they had done. Um, but right now, we obviously, we need Saudi Arabia when it comes to the Chinese or the Russians um, or Iran. Um, and, and I'll just end here on this, that if an Iran deal is struck and the U.S. returns to providing significant amounts of uh, funding to the Iranians and legitimizes the regime um, to the scale that I think they will be seen, um, I think we have a, a, a real problem on our hands. I can imagine that the Saudis might pull back further from this relationship, and that would have implications, obviously, for the, the entire region as well as oil. So I would say continue to watch this space. But do things do appear to be thawing, even if folks aren't exactly on the same page. Um, now, I'll end here with the question of Israel, because that's, of course, the question that's on everyone's mind. Will they? Won't they? Will we see normalization? Will we not? I would say that Iran continues to be the driver of those mutual interests shared by Saudi Arabia and Israel. I think uh, everybody recognizes that on the Saudi side of things, on the Israeli side of things. Um, the extent to which the Abraham Accords continue to demonstrate um, that there are benefits, I think also um, is, is a good sign. It's pushing the Israelis and Saudis in the right direction. And certainly the stability of the UAE and Bahrain, I think will also be a good sign for the Saudis that they could too take a step along those lines and not suffer significant instability or other consequences. That said, I, I don't think that it's going to move quickly. Um, that is the sense that we get, I think, from the Israelis and the Saudis. Um, the Saudis, the, some of the folks that we talked to um, explicitly noted that they are the leaders of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They see themselves as the leader of 57 Muslim states, and, they, um, and, and they're not willing to get ahead of all of their members, um, that they want to see this thing sort of move organically. I'm not sure that that's going to be always the case, but at least for now, I think it's a convenient excuse for the Saudis. Um, the Saudi peace plan, the one that was, uh, I think, originally uh, concocted by the Jordanians and then ultimately um, hijacked by Tom Friedman, uh, but is known as the Saudi peace plan. Uh, this is still, I think, the uh, the thing that they point to. They say, look, Israel, if you get out of all of the 60s, the territories conquered in the 67 war, um, you'll have the full recognition of the entire Arab League. That is still where they stand on things. Uh, you know, whether that's the only game in town, I think, uh, remains to be seen. I'm not convinced. What I can tell you, though, is that the, the rhetoric is fascinating. First of all, Saudis never said the word Israel out loud um, in, in, in visits past. Now they're openly talking about Israel. It's, you know, it's, it's no longer the Zionist entity. It is Israel. And that's a, that's a positive thing in and of itself. There's a recognition that Israel's strong, that it's here to stay. Um, and some of the things that we heard, and I'll just give you a quote, we want this Palestinian issue out of the way. We want this gone. Those were things that we heard Saudi say, and it was just really interesting to hear them frame it that way, as if to say this is a nuisance um, and that it's no longer something that they're interested in pushing on, but that rather, hey, can we just get this done with already so we can move on with the rest of our lives? I think that's a positive message, even if it doesn't mean that peace is around the corner. In the meantime, we see opportunities for continued engagement through CENTCOM, where Israel joined in the autumn of last year. It's about a year old now. Um, connections through the intelligence communities that we, I think, have long been aware of. Probably meetings that are taking place in Bahrain um, or perhaps other Gulf states. There is a broad appreciation inside Saudi Arabia for what Israel is um, conducting uh, in terms of asymmetric warfare, the so-called war between wars, I think has generated a lot of um, excitement among the Saudis that watch at what Israel is able to do and how it really doesn't appear to be cowered uh, by Iran. And I think that is um, really an interesting thing to watch as well. But again, the key here is stability and prosperity. These are the things that Saudi uh, officials continue to stress. Um, they stress it unofficially. They stress it through these multiple PowerPoints that you see that are created by McKinsey that we watch throughout the kingdom. Um, and so stability and prosperity, I think, will ultimately drive things forward. The U.S. needs to take a more active role or not. Now, the big question that we all had on the trip was whether there would be booze before peace with Israel or peace with Israel before booze. 
Um, I happen to think that, you know, we'll probably see the legalization of alcohol and neom before peace with Israel. So, you know, in another two or three years, we can have another conversation and see where things go. But in the meantime, I have to say, it almost doesn't matter which comes first. The change is remarkable. It's important for American interests. It has potential influence on Israeli ties and regional peace. And so things are moving in the right direction. Are they guaranteed to move in that direction in perpetuity? Absolutely not. Are we seeing every indicator that can give us a clear sense of what's happening in the kingdom? Absolutely not. But it is a sea change from what I have seen in the past and I think what we know of Saudi history from decades past as well. So I'll end there and I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. All right, thank you so much. The first question is from Claire Lopez. So far we're seeing significant changes in what be what might be called social mores, but do you expect to see substantial changes to the observance of Islamic law? And she goes on to state that the removal of the punishment of flogging is one such example. Yeah, I, I don't see those changes happening anytime soon. Um, I think a lot of this is about how the Saudis interface with others, um, the rules for their own people, what happens behind closed doors, what happens um, it, within their judiciary, for example, I, I don't get a sense of that. I know that polygamy is still a thing. Um, I know that, um, that, for example, they're not interested in building churches or synagogues. Um, there, there, is, there are going to be limitations to all of this. And again, let me just stress, I don't believe that we're watching you know, Saudi Arabia turn into a Jeffersonian democracy. That's not what's happening here. I think it's going to maintain a lot of its character. Um, but we're seeing some of these changes right now at the same time which I think is extremely positive. It won't change everything in the region, but I would say that Saudi Arabia is, we could expect something of a domino effect, whether it's peace with Israel or other steps that are taken to make the country less of a danger to other countries in the region. Absolutely. Uh, so we have some questions about tourists, tourism. David S. Levine asks, are non-Muslim tourists allowed in Mecca and Medina? And Carrie Hillebrand asks, are Israeli tourists, albeit with foreign passports, welcome? So my understanding is that if you have a foreign passport, you can come. Um, and uh, my understanding also is that Mecca and Medina are not open to, um, to non-Muslims. Uh, I do know of at least one instance in which um, a, uh, a, a Jewish American was able to go but I don't know whether that is something that the kingdom would welcome on a more regular basis. That may have been something of a one-off. There was, of course, that uh, unfortunate incident of an Israeli uh, journalist who was there on the Biden trip and decided to make the trek to Medina. Um, and he really drew the ire of uh, the Saudi state. They were very unhappy with the fact that he conducted that report from there. Look, I would just say this, that I don't particularly appreciate that policy. Uh, but it is their sovereign right to impose it. Um, I, I would hope that at some point they realize that there could be one heck of a tourism industry. The going to the Grand Mosque would be akin to going to, you know, something like the Taj Mahal. Um, I think it could be the kind of thing that could attract a lot of attention from Western tourists um, and could put the kingdom on the map. In the meantime, they have other things that they're trying to do to lure people to the kingdom uh, for fun in the desert, you know, um, you know, beautiful hotels, um, you know, uh, out outdoor sort of nature activities, all of these things are relatively new to the kingdom. And um, it's really interesting to watch them put this focus on tourism. It's they're looking outward. Um, and this is the significant change that uh, at least I'm noticing that we didn't see a decade ago. Well, thank you. Nizam Bori asks, uh, what action should Israel take to advance the relation with Saudi Arabia? Um, look, I, it's a good question. I think part of it um, we can distill down to that war between wars, the ongoing activity between uh, Iran and Israel in, in the shadows and at night. Um, the more that Israel is able to eat Iran's lunch, uh, the more the uh, that the Arab states are going to be looking and saying, we want to be part of that, right? These are guys that know how to beat back our enemies, and we have a common interest in doing so. So I think the Israelis just simply fighting for their own interests uh, when it comes to Iran, I think, is significant and, and certainly worthwhile. 
Um, you know, there is talk about what Israel can do to alleviate uh, the challenges that the Palestinians endure in terms of freedom of movement or things along those lines. Um, I don't know whether they have a direct impact on all of this, but certainly if the Saudis are delivering messages that are indirect uh, or direct to the Israelis and the Israelis appear to be responding in some shape or form, perhaps that can build, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a level of trust. I don't know if there would be a direct one-to-one -one correlation. You know, you build an airport for the Palestinians and you take another step closer to peace. Uh, but certainly, I think it's a proposition worth testing. Um, I do believe that if Israel is able to make peace with its surrounding neighbors, um, there will be pressure on the Palestinians to keep, you know, a lot of the um, uh, the violence and and, um, and 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 chaos under control. Absolutely. And of course, the focus of this webinar was on the U.S. relations. So David S. Levine asked, do you think the Democrats will ever allow the Saudis to forget the murder of uh, Khashoggi? Uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, Khashoggi's murder was, of course, brutal, um, inexcusable, un unexplainable. Um, and um, you have a guy that is going to be the crown prince and then probably the king uh, of Saudi Arabia for, you know, if, uh, I mean, he's young, he's 37 years old. The guy has potentially another 50 years under his belt here um, or 40 years. So that's a long time. So there is going to have to be, I think, some generational changes that take place in, uh, in Congress in particular. Um, I do think that it's promising that uh, President Biden who you know campaigned on the notion that he wanted to turn Saudi Arabia into a pariah state is no longer doing that. Again, I think that it, it's perfectly reasonable to try to hold Saudi Arabia to account for 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 this crime. The question is at what cost uh, and for how long, and will the United States you know use this as a means to prevent um, the production of oil or to prevent normalization with Israel? Um, these are the sorts of things you can't forget what the American interest here is, and that is stability and prosperity in the region, and of course, the steady supply of oil. So those are the things that you need to put first and foremost. Of course, we've got morals and ethics and policies that we want to make sure that the Saudis understand and embrace. Uh, but that is, that's, I mean, the, the irony of all of it is that a lot of that is taking place. A lot of the changes that we, for many years, were trying to thrust upon the Saudis and they appeared resistant. Now they're doing it, and they're doing it regardless of what we tell them. There is just this one issue that is lingering over everybody, and that was the brutal murder of a journalist. And um, at some point, um, I don't know how, I don't know when, but uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans are likely going to have to uh, swallow it maybe not love it, uh, but with the idea that it's time to move on because there are other things at play. Thank you. And do you see any hesitancy from the U.S. in creating these relations, uh, especially uh, with the risk of radical Islam taking over with, with a revolution? Look, I, you know, I think that that is the key to all of this is, you know, it, you know, can we count on this in the long term? Is, is it stable in the long term? Right now, it's very difficult to see um, whether there is significant instability. I was aware of at least one uh, failed terrorist attack several weeks before I was in the kingdom. Um, I think there still is a terrorism alert that is placed on Saudi Arabia by the U.S. State Department, as well as a number of foreign ministries. But, you know, the extent to which we have a visual on that, I just I don't I, I don't have a lot of understanding of what the threat actually is and how much the US or other countries are keeping it under control. Um, but I think the broader question that you ask is the big one is, is this something that is sustainable? Are we gonna see continued reform? Are we gonna see continued efforts to really uh, stamp out the influence of Wahhabism? I will say that the, 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 the diminishing of the support for this Wahhabist movement, the, um, the proselytization abroad, has dropped immensely. And you can, I think, begin to see the impact um, in other places around the Muslim world. That in and of itself, I have to say, is, is truly laudable. Uh, but again, I, I think there is a, a, you ask really the right question is how much can you trust this? How stable is the kingdom? I will say the longer this goes on and the more that we see reform, the more it's likely to stay. Um, and that is, I would say, a good sign for now. Um, but again, uh, how do you predict the future in the Middle East? Good Lord, I don't try. 
That is a very good point. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, before we go, can you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Sure. You can find my work at um, FDD.org, uh, at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, where I'm Senior Vice President for Research and write good, a good bit on uh, the Palestinians, Turkey, illicit finance, Iran. Um, also, you can find me on Twitter at Jay Shanzer, J-S-C-H-A-N-Z-E-R. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Shanzer, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. For our viewers, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.